Jumps are a crucial part of most sports and are one of the most attractive and fun activities to perform. It's no wonder a great jump is a sensational feat. It's a display of power like no other. Not only did you need strong muscles to perform these feats, but also strong tendons, and arguably the role is even more important in such activities. With all that power comes a great cost, an immense stress on the body, and if it's not properly addressed, planned and programmed for, it can lead to overuse injuries and in severe cases, ruptures. Tendinopathy is a term describing pain and dysfunction of a tendon. It's a major problem for some of the more traditional sports like basketball, volleyball, football and athletics, and maybe even a greater one for the newer sports like parkour and tricking due to not fully developed training methodology and coaching system. If untreated correctly, it can end an athlete's career because this condition doesn't get better by itself. Time heals a lot of things, but not tendinopathy. It is treatable though, but there isn't an overnight cure, the recovery takes time. In this video, I will explain what tendinopathy actually is and how it occurs, as well as how to fully diagnose, recover and prevent further pathologies from recurring. The focus will be on patellar and Achilles tendinopathy, but the approach is somewhat relatable for the other ones. Understanding what's going on in a tendon on a cellular level, how the damage occurs and how a tissue adapts is a must when considering a recovery strategy. On top of that, understanding the forces at play in different activities helps us choose the optimal training load for the best rehab results. This is what separates the copy-paste programs that you can find online that can be a hit or miss and the tailored programs that have consistently high success rates across all patients. I'll be placing different chapters in this video so you can skip to the one of your interest, but I highly advise watching the whole video. For those who don't know, tendon is an organ that connects a muscle to the bone. It has a purpose of transmitting a force that muscle generates onto a bone it's attached to, which is causing the body to move. They have a role of storing and releasing elastic energy during fast movements, kind of like stretching a rubber band before you send it flying, or compressing a spring before it bounces back. That process is called stretch shortening cycle, and it enhances the force we produce in our fast movements. It occurs every time you squat down before a jump or swing an arm back in order to throw a ball. During slow movements, less elastic energy is being stored and even more energy is being lost in the process compared to fast movements, which is one of the reasons they are not as stressful for the tendon. Fast movements, and especially the ones with high load as well, store a great amount of energy and are more stressful for the tendon, and jumps fall in that category. To put in perspective, during barbell squat, the peak ground reaction force is around 3 to 5 times body weight, depending on the relative weight you're able to lift. However, during the triple jump, the step phase to be more precise, peak ground reaction force reaches astonishing 15 times body weight. Knee joint is the main contributor here for dispersion and production of force. Having said this, it's only natural that majority of athletes suffering from patellar tendinopathy are involved in jumping activities, though different activities will be hazardous for different body parts. Running, for instance, is not as stressful for the tendons of the knee, but it is for the Achilles tendon since that's where the highest load is in that type of movement. Something like hockey, where an athlete is bent in the hips, will be detrimental for the hamstring tendon, and so on. So how do we diagnose tendinopathy? To answer that, we need to look at the pain, function and training history. To start off, it's important to note that pathology does not equal pain. Many athletes who have pathology don't actually have pain. Furthermore, a lot of athletes, if not most of the athletes involved in plyometric activities, have some level of tendon pathology already present. Just because you don't have pain does not mean that you have perfectly healthy tendons. Therefore, you should all care about the loads you place your tendons under. Patellar tendinopathy seems to be a condition developing in adolescence. It's reported that majority of male athletes who had pathology at the age of 15 or 16 still had it in the adulthood, but only few athletes developed it from scratch as adults. Patellar tendon only fully matures post-puberty, which means we should be quite careful on how we train kids in the early teens. Unfortunately, this is also with training raises in intensity and transitions from play to more serious sports training. Thus, this time frame is when majority of pathology and patellar tendon develops. This is not the case with the Achilles tendon though, where most affected groups seems to be middle-aged men. When it comes to sex differences, 
Females in general have lower risk of tendinopathy, probably due to high estrogen levels, which seems to act as a shield. However, after the menopause the risk increases significantly. Girls also enter puberty sooner than boys, finishing their growth a few years earlier. By the time training raises in intensity, their patellar tendons are fully developed, which altogether makes girls more protected from the early development of patellar tendinopathy. Pain is probably the worst during stretch shortening cycle activities. It also increases with load, which means you can squat down slowly without pain, but if you try to jump following a fast squat or load that squat substantially, the pain will arise. Warming up eases the pain, however, if you continue with activity despite that pain, it will increase the following day. It also results in feeling of tightness in the tendons when resting, which is especially true early in the morning. You feel a bit like walking on stilts, especially when walking up and down the stairs. The pain is almost always localized to an area of 1-2 to two centimeters, and it does not spread. For the knee joint, it's mainly at the attachment of the patella tendon, just below the kneecap. It can occur above the kneecap as well and at the attachment to tibia, although those cases are not as frequent. For the Achilles, the pain is usually in the middle of the tendon and seldom at the attachment to the heel bone. When it comes to training history, if you have practiced too much, too soon, too often, this is a likely scenario. High storage and release of elastic energy and high loads on the tendon over an extended period of time are some of the red flags. The most affected group seems to be jumpers and runners, which includes team sports like basketball, football, etc. But non-athletes can also be affected. If you suddenly picked up a new sport, change the type of physical activity from something slow like yoga to first one like dancing, this is a risk factor. The tendons are not used to that type of load, and they develop a pathology. The same goes with changes in surface stiffness. If you've been training on grass or in a gym or a track and suddenly move to concrete, if you switched from running shoe to barefoot shoe but kept similar intensity. If you suddenly shortened ground contact time in all of your jumps. In my case, I switched from parkour to athletics rather suddenly. And even though both are jumping activities, parkour involves much slower ground contact times. That change put a lot of stress on my Achilles tendon, which is insufficiently trained in that regime, and it caused a tendinopathy. Tendinopathy also often creeps up on you, and it appears suddenly. It often arises after a prolonged break that follow an intensive training cycle. If you've been away from a sport because of an illness or some injury, or whatever the case is, and got back with the same intensity, that could have resulted in manifestation of pathology. All these are risk factors that you have to keep in mind. Now, let's say you've been lifting weights slowly and got knee pain. It is unlikely it's patellar tendinopathy, since there were no large load spikes in the tendon, no storage and release of elastic energy. If we exclude all of the aforementioned red flags, we should look at the other conditions and see if they fit the narrative. Likewise, if you've been cycling a lot and got Achilles pain, it's unlikely it's tendinopathy since there were no high loads in the tendon. It's possibly a different condition, presumably a peritendon problem caused by irritation due to tendon gliding, and that is something we often see in cyclists. That is why differential diagnosis is important, which means excluding all of the other conditions that similar symptoms might respond to. For example, a large percentage of patients diagnosed with patellar tendinopathy actually have patellofemoral pain syndrome, and its rehabilitation procedure is quite different. Lastly, there are questionnaires, visa A and visa P, for Achilles and patellar tendinopathy respectively. They can be used when evaluating the severity of tendinopathy, as well as tracking the effectiveness of a rehab program. They are useful tools to have even for someone who cannot see a therapist, since low scores in that test certainly point to tendinopathy. What about imaging? Do we need it? Well, no, not really. Even though we have really good tools like ultrasonography and UTC, which are one of the best for tendon properties to date, results are not going to be of much use when it comes to treatment. Why? Well, in a scenario where imaging shows you have pathology in patella tendon, but your pain is actually caused by, let's say, patellofemoral pain syndrome, because remember, pathology does not equal pain, then your rehab would be on the wrong track. That is why clinical assessment might be a better option when you talk about diagnosis. On the other hand, monitoring the pathology through imaging can be a waste of time and money, since pain and function are our primary indicators and not the clinical image. If the pain and function are improving, so will the clinical image. Structure When it comes to structure, there are three main components. The cells, collagen and the matrix. The majority of tendon is made up of water, but the dry portion is predominantly made of type 1 collagen. 
collagen molecules form small fibers that then bundle together into greater ones and so on, and they all reside in tendon matrix. Tendon cells are the ones producing the matrix, as well as the collagen. They have ways of communicating with each other and with the surrounding matrix as well. If we load the tendon, the cells will get that information from the matrix via integrin switches and communicate with each other to give a response based on a load type, magnitude and duration. This mechanosensitivity is not exclusive to tendons, but the bones, muscles and other connective tissue as well. This is the key to tendon rehabilitation from a microscopic perspective. If we load the tendon properly, it can create new tendon material as a response. One area of a tendon that is of particular interest to us is the attachment to the bone, the enthesis. Muscles and bones have different mechanical properties. There is an obvious difference in hardness and malleability, so joining the two is always a difficult task. The enthesis tries to make the transition smooth by gradually stiffening the tendon. It is, however, still the most vulnerable section and most tendinopathies occur at these insertions, with some exceptions like Achilles tendinopathy. Tendons have a characteristic stress-strain curve. Elongation of a tendon in sports is usually above 5%, which is a point where micro failures occur. As previously mentioned, vertical load in jumping sports can reach 15 times body weight in single leg in case of a triple jump, or 8 to 9 times body weight in volleyball and basketball. With basketball players jumping around 15 times per average during the game, and volleyball players around 100 times, it's clear how that can pose a risk for overuse injuries. Another important role in tendinopathy development is the distribution of load, i.e. not every collagen fiber is under the same tension. This is more exaggerated in patellar tendon, and especially in deep knee flexion. The anterior, or the front part of the tendon, is under more load than the posterior part, which is being stress shielded. Great joint angles also introduce compressive loads on a tendon, which can locally reduce tendon tensile strength, making it more prone to injury. Performing at great muscle tendon lengths will also increase tensile load substantially. This is why an activity like weightlifting, where an athlete catches a barbell in deep knee flexion with very little room for dampening at the impact, is posing a risk for tendinopathy. Almost the same goes in parkour for landings in deep squat. When we scan the pathological tendon and examine its properties, it will almost always have lower tendon stiffness, but it will be larger in diameter, thicker. In healthy individuals, a thicker tendon means higher stiffness, but since that is not the case, it implies that structural changes occurred, i.e. collagen fiber structure becomes disorganized, unaligned. That means for the same load, the pathological tendon will stretch more, further increasing the risk of tear and contributing to pathology, but not providing more energy storage because the quality of tissue has worsened. Loading a tendon triggers an increase in collagen synthesis and collagen degradation for the next three or so days, and degradation is happening a tad quicker. If the period between these heavy loadings is too short, or the load is too great, the degradation will overtake synthesis of collagen protein and the net balance will be negative. This degradation causes a deterioration in collagen quality, from type 1 to type 3, which has weaker mechanical properties and has less tensile strength, so it's more prone to rupture. How collagen is structured is almost as important as net synthesis. Highly aligned collagen is preferred over more randomly distributed one. In addition to collagen, other matrix proteins also respond to load, and they are responsible for organization and development of a tendon, so the whole matrix starts falling apart in the end. Karam Khan used this analogy of matrix as a cement holding bricks together, with bricks being the cells. So you can think of this oozing cement as a matrix losing its structure, and the walls, being the tendon, losing its stability and strength. What happens to cells? Aren't they regulating both matrix and collagen? Well. This is the issue underlying the whole pathology. Tendon cells die. This is believed to be the main cause of tendinopathy. They die in an organized, tidy fashion called apoptosis, which is contrary to the inflammatory that you might see in muscle rupture or something. This is leading to the matrix breakdown, and the absence of cells is lowering the rate of collagen synthesis, thus reducing the rate at which the tendon can heal. In summary, these are the hypothesized stages in cycle of tendon pathology development. Overuse causes apoptosis that leads to degradation of collagen, resulting in loss of tensile strength, which may lead to rupture if the issue is unaddressed. However, rupture is unlikely due to an increase in thickness, and that seems to be the tendon's way of adapting to pathology.
Rehabilitation of tendinopathy has a set of challenges and it's certainly come a long way over the years. Before the 90s, tendinitis was the general term used for describing the pathology. The suffix itis, of course, denounces inflammation because the inflammation was thought to be the leading cause. The problem is, you treat inflammation with thrusting, anti-inflammatory therapies, corticosteroid injections and more, all of which are quite detrimental in the case of tendinopathy we know of today. Some of these therapies do seem to help, but because they affect pain rather than function and tissue itself, while others straight up don't work. The predicament is that it's uncertain what exactly causes the pain, and we don't know the exact moment at which that pain goes away. Nevertheless, treating pain without treating the tissue is obviously not the best idea, because it just masks the underlying problem and can potentially worsen the pathology. On top of that, it is only a short-term solution. However, it can be completely justified if an athlete needs to perform despite an injury, or a patient has a lower tolerance to pain and can't commit to a rehabilitation program. A couple of non-invasive treatments for tendinopathy that don't revolve around inflammation seems to have promising results, but there is insufficient evidence for strong conclusions for now. My own advice would be to stay away from these treatments, since it can be a gamble in a way, and to focus your time and attention on what we have almost conclusive evidence on, and that's this exercise. Now that we know that cells are the key to pathology, and we know about their mechanosensitivity, mechanical loading is our main tool in the treatment. It's debatable whether or not it's actually possible to cure the pathology. So far, the evidence for that is weak. However, don't let that discourage you. We can build new tendon material around pathological tissue, which can be just as strong, if not stronger. A pathological tendon seems to have more healthy material than a normal tendon, although less functional. That means that we don't have to worry about bad tissue, and the priority is not just on generating a new one, but on distribution of collagen within it, thus improving mechanical properties which will restore its function. To achieve this, tendon needs to be placed under an optimal load, high enough and long enough to cause an adaptation, but not to increase strain and cause further damage. An increase in tendon thickness is the greatest in the region where tendon is under the most load. That seems to correspond with the regions where pathology occurs. It seems, however, that most likely an increase in tendon thickness and in tendon's mechanical properties takes a lot of time, which would explain why rehabilitation of tendinopathy takes so long. The first step in rehabilitation is to identify and minimize the load that is causing you pain. That can be something like big jumps and drops, heavy landings, fast change of direction, or acceleration and decelerations. Figure it out, remove it or reduce it as much as you can. The second step is to figure out the optimal load to use in your rehabilitation. That answer lies in the pain and our knowledge of tendon loads in different exercises. Having some pain during rehabilitation is completely fine, as long as it is minimal, up to 2 or 3 out of 10 on a subjective scale. Pain the day after the workout is a way of monitoring the intensity, as it peaks around 24 hours post-exercise. To have consistent results, load response tests should be introduced, where you load the tendon the same way every day and see how much pain you feel. The test should vary depending on the current state of pathology. For the patella tendon, it can be a simple squat or a single leg squat with elevated heel or a squat jump. For Achilles, it can be a heel raise on one or two legs or a single leg hop. The pain should never be increasing day to day. It should either stay the same or decrease as we increase the load in our training. The increase in pain means that load was too high and you should decrease it for the next session. Remember to change only one thing at a time. Whether it's an increase in load, a change in exercise speed or an introduction of a new exercise. This incremental progression allows you to optimize the load and recognize and deal with potential issues if they arise. The third step is choosing the exercise protocol. To change tendon properties, the type of muscle contraction doesn't matter all that much but what's important is the overall magnitude of the load. Tendon needs to be placed under sufficient load for a certain amount of time. Therefore, something like slow concentric, slow eccentric and isometric should induce a positive change in tendon properties. Eccentrics have been a staple in tendinopathy rehabilitation for two decades, especially for the Achilles tendinopathy. It was one of the first protocols to show a great long-term improvements in pain and function, although rehab protocols progressed a lot since then. Both heavy slow resistance training and isometric training were indeed shown to have similar or greater effects than eccentric training in tendinopathy rehabilitation, but mostly due to patient satisfaction. 
people actually need to stick with the program and do the prescribed loads, and that is more difficult if the program is uninteresting or takes a lot of time. To get an athlete back to their sport, the tendon needs to be prepared for high storage and release of elastic energy and high peak strains. You can't get that with isometric or heavy slow resistance training. This is when eccentrics and plyometrics come into play. Therefore, it is not about which loading you should use, it's when you use it and for what purpose. In line with this, Maliaris and colleagues formulated a four-stage rehabilitation program. Isometrics, heavy slow resistance, energy storage and release, and return to sport. I personally am in favor of this strategy for both Achilles and patellar tendinopathies. Other strategies work or may work as well, and you're free to try them. There is a great paper titled Diagnosing Achilles Tendinopathies Like Delicious Spaghetti Carbonara. It's all about the key ingredients, but not all chefs use the same recipe, and I think that sums up this topic nicely. I added my personal touch to these protocols, but you can see the original ones in citations of the blog post. Isometric training. Probably the best at reducing pain, both immediately and long term. It loads the tendon at a steady, constant rate, and it excels at building tissue and improving its properties. When it comes to load and duration, 4 to 5 sets or 30 to 45 seconds isometrics should be performed almost every day in this first rehab stage. Some authors even endorse 2 to 3 sessions per day. I recommend doing this 5 to 6 days a week, depending on your activity levels and maybe performing an additional 3-4 to four sessions if you are very inactive. Those 30-45 to 45 seconds of exercise duration should be near your maximum for that isometric hold. Having muscle tremor can be a sign of too much load if it's not a balancing issue. Of course, a little warm-up in the form of 2-3 to three isometric holds of 10-15 to 15 seconds should precede the session. These daily isometric exercises should continue throughout the rehabilitation process. Walking up the stairs every second step is one of my favorite exercises. I also use it to test pain 24 hours after the workout. Since it's a purely concentric exercise, I'm mentioning it here as I feel it can be implemented before the heavy slow resistance exercises. Heavy slow resistance training. Its purpose is to build strength throughout different ranges of motion used in the actual sporting activity. You should transition to this stage when more difficult isometric exercises can be performed with minimal pain. Regarding the intensity and volume, 3 to 4 sets of 15 RM progressing to 6 RM performed every second day are recommended. Progression can lead to inclusion of multiple exercises, thus an increase in volume. Isometrics should be continued on the off days to manage pain. During this phase, it's advisable to work on every locomotion deficiency, strengthening the antagonist muscles as well. Hamstrings and glutes have an important role in jumping task, and they should be strengthened accordingly. Calves take a lot of load during jumping exercises, so even if you're dealing with patellar tendinopathy, you should improve calf strength and function. For the Achilles, the function of soleus muscle could be important in management of tendinopathy.
energy storage and release. Stretch shortening cycle activities by themselves don't cause morphological changes in tendons, simply because the time tendons spend under load is too short compared to isometric training for instance. However, plyometrics can most likely cause a change in tendons mechanical structure, since it can cause an increase in tendon stiffness despite causing no changes in tendon thickness. This is a sign of change in collagen organization. Reintroduction of these types of exercises is therefore mandatory for athletes looking to return to high energy storage and release activities. Transition to this phase should happen when you can tolerate plyometric exercises, that means no increase in pain 24 hours after, as well as when you get sufficiently strong, and that is difficult to quantify. Authors of these recommendations are mentioning single leg press, four sets of eight reps with 150 times body weight. Even though leg press is great for scientific purposes, since it's easy to measure and quantify the load, I would argue about its efficacy in athletes' actual training. Therefore, I suggest the back squat, or front squat if you prefer, for four sets of six reps with one and a half times body weight. However, the exact number depends on an athlete and may vary significantly. The exercise choice in this stage is the most important and challenging so far and should be individualized for every sport based on athlete's movement intentions. Progression should happen from slower stretch shortening cycle movements of different joint angles and low intensity to exercises that mimic joint angles, ground contact times and forces an athlete is performing at. For example, if we take a look at the knee joint, in athletics it usually operates in upper range and seldom reaches 90 degrees while in parkour, most of the jumps are initiated from that 90 degree angle, but they also go into deep knee flexion when landing. Exercise choice should correspond to these demands. This stage of the protocol should not be performed more than two times per week at first, as this is the time necessary for the collagen synthesis to complete, and you should carefully progress towards three times per week as you adapt. Stages one and two of this rehab protocol should still be performed twice per week. The volume should increase gradually as tolerated. An increase in volume should happen before an increase in intensity, and both should progress incrementally. Exerted effort can be a regulator of intensity more than a choice of exercise performed. For example, light hops and maximal hops have drastically different tendon loading rates, even though they are the same exercise. Accordingly, you should exert minimal amount of effort in jumps when transitioning to the third stage, and increase it gradually over time before the introduction of new, more demanding exercises. The transition from lower intensity to higher intensity exercises should happen gradually over the course of a few months. Getting back to sports training should technically replace the third stage of rehabilitation, which means 2-3 to three sessions per week should be adequate. This of course depends on the level of demand. The highest loads should be undertaken not less than 3 days apart. This of course should essentially apply to all athletes, not just symptomatic ones. The increase in load should be gradual again. In parkour, since a great part of the sport is plyometrics itself, this is when you introduce greater jumps 
introduction of elevation difference in precision jumps, moderate running precision jumps, cat pass precisions, etc. Focus should be on technique and control, and again, raising volume before a raise in intensity. That means not just a progressive increase in distance, but doing jumps on elevated obstacle first and progressing towards lowered ones. Part 1 of this protocol can be practiced whenever the time frame allows it, and it can be incorporated into this fourth phase as well, either before or after the training session. Phase 2 should be practiced twice per week. Rehabilitation advice. The literature presents this protocol in a very strict, systematic manner, where it's divided into four stages, strict traps, etc. It has to be strict, it's easy to gather data that way, and it's replicable. However, the adaptation doesn't happen in stages. The athletes are also not robots that can do everything by the book, and researchers know that, so don't be afraid if you are not following it faithfully. Sometimes you get sick and don't train, you go to a party or concert and jump and dance even if you are not supposed to. Or you just decide you want to play or train despite your pain because you just feel like so. Other times, professional setting might require you to perform movements not favorable for your condition. What you have to keep in mind though is the overall magnitude of the load, so if you went wild on a couple of occasions, just dial it back a bit with intensity and everything will be fine. There is also a factor of technique degradation when you step down from a sport to focus on rehabilitation. In a professional environment, this can have terrifying consequences. This is why you must continue to train every aspect of your sport that is not harmful for your tendons, like shooting, ball control, flexibility, balance, etc. The stages of this protocol are there to give structure, but they are not as strict. I also don't advise jumping straight from strict isometrics to squats, or straight from squats to plyometrics. Do some transitional work. If you are transitioning from stage 1 to stage 2, Try adding one very low intensity exercise to your sessions that has both concentric and eccentric portion. Then gradually raise the load, volume and number of exercises. Start barbell squats with pause at the bottom and very slow eccentric for example. You won't be able to do that for 15 reps as prescribed, but it will be more effective if you start from that point. Gradually increase the speed of the lift and then adjust for the reps according to your level of exhaustion. The same is with plyometrics. First, increase the speed of your lifts. Try adding 1-2 to two low intensity plyometric exercises at the start of your each session and continue to increase the volume until you decide to do plyometric training separately. Do everything gradually. Throughout rehabilitation, as soon as we are done managing pain in the first phase, we are constantly preventing the recurrence of symptoms. The rehabilitation follows guidelines the same way a general training should. The only difference is, in my opinion, that training doesn't have to be as precise when it comes to load management, meaning you can push the intensity up with asymptomatic athletes without having an immediate backlash as you would with someone dealing with tendinopathy. That being said, you can only push so far, mining the overused injuries of course, but more room for error makes the athletes and coaches life much easier. The recurrence of tendinopathy is quite common, and reportedly more prevalent in athletes who return to sport sooner. That means athletes who take longer to rehab have less chance of re-injury. Taking your time with tendinopathy treatment, being patient and trusting the process will definitely pay off in the end. The key to tendinopathy prevention is of course the optimal loading of the tendons. In regards to that, you need to know the following. First, the time it takes for collagen to repair after each intensive training session. As we already mentioned, collagen degrades and synthesizes after exercise, and net synthesis is set after more than one and a half days. Not respecting the time frame will lead you towards tendinopathy. If the magnitude of the load was moderate, the net synthesis will take place sooner and the risk of overuse injuries will lessen. This leads to our second point. We need to know the tendon loads, or at least ground reaction forces, for each frequently performed movements. You have Baxter et al's tier list for Achilles tendon loads in various movement tasks. For Patali tendon, we don't have such list, but we have various data on loading in horizontal versus vertical jumps. From this we can conclude that horizontal jumps are way more tasking on patellar tendon than vertical jumps, and sudden stops will increase the loading rates drastically. There is a study titled Jumper's Knee or Lander's Knee, 
a systematic review of landings for both vertical and horizontal jumps and their influence of tendinopathy found exactly that. Landings are the most concerning part of the jump, especially if you have forward momentum as well. Overall, it seems that quick ground contact or phase change of velocity, be it stiff landing, deceleration, acceleration or change in direction, will result in higher loading rate of the tendon. It goes without saying that both vertical and horizontal displacements are major contributors as well, just be a bit more cautious with horizontal ones. Some of these exercises performed in sports are so demanding that some athletes can't perform them well. If the athlete yields too much or is too slow off the ground, the stress is too great for the current level of athlete and they need to adjust muscle tendon strength and or coordination before attempting to perform in that intensity. Those exercises definitely cause excessive strain on the tendon and place an athlete in high risk zone, which should be avoided as much as possible. Being moderate with selection and dosage of high loading rate exercises brings us to our third point, quantifying weekly volume of intensive movements. Some coaches started counting the number of jumps using various tools their players are making during the training in game and it had positive results in reduction of overuse injuries. Don't have to go that far of course, but the subjective level of exhaustion and the performance levels are good enough indicators. If you feel tired, replace an intensive exercise with less demanding one or stop completely. Likewise, if your performance in intensive plyometric exercise drops, that is the point where you probably get diminishing returns and that should be a signal to halt. The fourth thing you need to know is the time it takes for tendon properties to deteriorate following detraining. This should concern anyone who took time off training for whatever reason. Just a month of detraining reduces tendon stiffness by a huge margin, while the neural component of muscle strength stays the same. This means that when you get back to training, you have almost the same power, but your tendons are now weaker and can't follow up. If you do high intensity exercises at this point, it's a recipe for injury. Parkour covers a vast variety of movement tasks – jumping, climbing, vaulting, balancing, rolling, etc. It has both a structured coaching system – parkour classes, workshops – and is free for individuals to train by themselves. Views on what parkour is and how it should be trained vary even within a single community, based on a training history of individuals, personal preference, cultural factors, etc. It varies between different communities, from nation to nation, continent to continent. Because of this great diversity, it's very difficult to present statistics that should represent the whole sport. However, those statistics are necessary in order to identify issues within a sport and remove the risk of bias. We have two papers so far that looked at injuries in parkour and both reported tendinopathy being quite common amongst practitioners. To address possible causes, I will of course make a few assumptions, so take everything I say from now on as a hypothesis. Parkour revolves mostly around horizontal movement when you talk about jumping. Vertical leaps are most of the time unnecessary as we use every trick in a book to gain height. We push off the wall, we grab a ledge, tic tac off a pole, etc. Parkour also introduces sticking a jump, which now became the golden standard for everyone. Every cat pass must be stuck, every precision jump, every tic tac, every flip. Most of the jumps in parkour are heavy for the patella tendon, and rarely would you see someone suffering from Achilles tendinopathy. No, it's not impossible. My guess would be that people who practice tumbling and flipping are more likely to suffer from Achilles tendinopathy due to quicker ground contact times that are required to perform these feats. This is achieved by calf muscles primarily and knees are then almost fully straight, which is in contrast to classic parkour jumps where the knee extensors are the ones working harder. From those few studies, we've seen that horizontal jumps, especially the ones with sudden stops, are producing much greater loading rates in the tendon. I would really like to know the forces developed when sticking a running precision or a standing one with a hefty drop. It's needless to say that these are the jumps that are most demanding for patella tendons, and the amount of those jumps should be monitored. The mindset of doing the same jump 20, 50, 100 times until you make it is understandable from the spirit perspective, but very unwise from the perspective of your poor suffering tendons. My advice would be. Have those excursions with the smaller and more technical jumps that are not as stressful and prioritize your health with the bigger ones. Don't train jumps more than 3 times a week. Of course, if you're only doing a few big jumps per training it won't be an issue. But try to have a rough idea of how much jumping you did in a week and take proper rest. 
Remember you can't improve if you're injured. Work in your conditioning. If you don't have time to train it separately, do it after your training session just a bit. Exercises that were quite popular in the early days of parkour are often being criticized for not being specific enough. Even with that, they somehow survived the test of time, be it by pure luck or some extraordinary gut feeling tracer sat back then. Whatever the case is, for some of them I now see the real benefits. Quadrupedal movement is one of those exercises. It seems useless at first, but it works your quads in quasi-isometrics, so it ends up being a great exercise for building patellar tendon resilience. It can be argued it does the same thing for shoulders, providing the same benefits for those who do dive kongs, for example. Balancing on a rail does the same thing with calf muscles, traversing does the same thing for the rotator cuff, and so on. Gym training has been raising in popularity amongst athletes, and I'm a huge proponent as well. Lifting weights has a variety of benefits, and I highly suggest everyone to incorporate a bit of lifting into their training. Obviously, training outside can be almost as effective, just requires a bit out-of-the-box thinking and a lot more training knowledge and dedication to pull off. Lastly, take it very slowly when you're coming back after a prolonged break from training. This is something I see way too often. People want to come back, they start jumping, they get hurt, they stop, and the cycle continues. First few months should be prioritizing technique and control and strength and conditioning. I know it can be boring for someone, but just think long term. This can all be avoided if you never stop training in the first place. And finally, I'll leave you with this one message from Stefan Vigru. Because parkour is a very, very hard spot and physical spot, so you have to think what do you want for you. Tendinopathy develops due to overuse of tendon tissue if the intensity and volume are too great. Various jumping activities are the biggest contributors to this pathology. Patellar tendinopathy most likely develops in adolescence, so mind training intensity for kids in puberty. A localized pain in the tendon during stretch shortening cycle activities is an indicator of tendinopathy. The pain increases with load and decreases with warm-up. Training history can tell us a lot. Too much training, training after a long break, and sudden change in training methods are some of the indicators. Imaging is not that important for diagnosing tendinopathy, as asymptomatic tendons can have pathology present. The death of tendon cells is most likely what's initiating the tendinopathy, which leads to collagen and matrix degradation. Degraded tissue most likely cannot be repaired, however, creating new one is possible. Tendon cells can sense mechanical load, so if the stimuli are there, they will create new tendon material as a response. Tendons must be loaded in order to recover, so this is where exercise protocols come into play. Alternative treatments are not a wise option, and in most cases, it's a waste of time and money. What drives tendon adaptation is the overall magnitude of the load, and contraction type is less important. Every contraction type has its purpose, though. Isometric excels at building new tendon tissue and relieving pain. Slow resistant training excels at building strength and tendon mechanical properties. Eccentric training excels at building strength at a greater muscle tendon lengths and prepare the tendon for high strains. Plyometric training builds up tendon energy storage capacity, improves tendon function and prepares the body for the return of high intensity jumps. In order to avoid recurrence of tendinopathy, don't rush with recovery. Collagen takes 3 days to finish synthesizing, so do high-intensity training only 2-3 to three times per week. If you took a break from training, return slowly with a lot of conditioning and only low-intensity plyometrics. The tendons will lose a lot of mechanical properties in just one month of detraining, and that is when you're most prone to injury. Be wary of the overall intensity and volume of jumps, especially the horizontal ones. If you want to push repetitions in training, do so with resistance training, not with the intensive jumps. So that's it. You endured through my horrible English, but I hope it was helpful to you, and if it was, please like and subscribe. This was my first video, and I plan on making a lot more shorter videos on various topics. If you have any questions, please write them down in the comments, and I'll try to respond to all of them. You have written version of this video with citations and everything in the description, 
and make sure to follow me on Instagram because I will be posting some important stuff there as well. Until next video, bye bye.